go ahead and, uh, and get started. We have one seminar today. Um, we'll have a one completion seminar. So I'd like to introduce uh, Jacob Pachanka, advised by uh, John Lundgren and Laura Perkins. We'll be talking to us today about degrada degradation of cattle cats in eastern South Dakota by dung beetles. All right. Thanks. And thanks everyone for coming out this morning. Uh, yeah. So this is my master's completion, and what I'm going to share with you guys is just a chapter of my master's. There's uh, there's one experiment. There's a couple others, and just in the time frame, I'm going to go through this one with you guys. Start with a little bit of background. If you've driven through South Dakota at any point. Odds are you've seen rangelands. About 45% of the state's area is dedicated to it. A lot of cows on there, about 3.9 million, uh, estimated in 2012. So it represents a pretty sizable chunk of uh, South Dakota's economy. Really important that uh, the managers of those rangelands are taking care of them, that they're managed uh, in a way that's both ecologically sustainable and it's economically profitable for them to be able to keep doing it. And uh, the management choices that they use, such as how often they're rotating their cattle, how uh, dense they're packing them into a paddock, those are all going to have implications. And there's a lot of challenges that go into managing your cattle on the rangelands. One of those is dung. And this presentation is only going to get more appetizing from here. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, so everything a cow eats is going to get deposited back onto the soil in the form of dung, right? And uh, every cow, they're going to. Uh, leave a dung pad about 10 to 16 times a day, and that can amount to up to a meter squared every day that each cow is covering on the soil surface. It may not seem like a lot, but if you think about every cow doing that, you've got a herd of 50 to 100 cattle. It's a real big stinky problem. Luckily, uh, there's natural cycle of biotic and abiotic factors that are gonna degrade those dung pads. And that varies from system to system in really healthy pastures with quick recycling and regenerative practices you're gonna see those dung pass disappear for 50 to 70 days, but in really degraded pastures, it can be up to three years, and that's when you see those dry, uh, almost white cakes on the pasture surface, and that can be a really big problem. Uh, one of the uh, biotic factors that are contributing are arthropods, and dung is a really, really attractive resource, and if you take a look a little bit deeper, you can see there's a ton of activity going on in that dung pack and it's a really attractive resource and uh, at behaving as a food source and a habitat for these arthropods. Now I got some nice pictorial representations of what this looks like. Once the cow leaves a dung pad, it's instantly super attractive to a wide variety of arthropods. And once they get in there, they're gonna start burrowing, consuming. Uh, a lot of dung beetles use it for reproduction. And that's gonna keep going. And about, you'll see some degradation. About day four is gonna be the peak arthropod abundance and diversity, that's when you see the most of them, and that's when the dung is most attractive to them. And that's going to keep going relatively stable until about 14 days. In most systems around here, that's when the, a lot of the moisture has left the dung pad, and it's just not attractive, at least to these dung beetles anymore. And so you're going to see a lot of the arthropods leave, but they, many of them leave eggs behind and the larvae develop and eat the dry dung pads, and there are some other arthropods specialized to consume just the dry material. What we want to figure out in South Dakota here, at what point has that dung pack completely broken up, the nutrients have gotten the soil, and it's become really beneficial for our friends here to munch on. And those pictures I just showed you, a bunch of dung beetles swarming in and out of the pack, but really the com community is far more complex. Uh, studies all over the world have shown that in almost any cattle operation, you're going to see hundreds of specimens there across dozens of species. It's a really diverse community filling out a lot of niches. Uh, in South Dakota, actually Brookings County, uh, 1972 was the last time any of this was looked at. And as a lot of us in here have looked at, landscape and agriculture has changed a heck of a lot in the last 50 years. And so there's probably a really different community that we can see out there. And uh, as a, that diagram kind of showed, throughout this, there's successional waves of arthropods uh, colonizing the dung pad as the attractiveness of the dung changes. Part of the dung pad is represented by uh, a, a group of negative arthropods. Flies, you see them buzzing around a cow space, causing all sorts of problems, biting, blood loss, and even disease transmission. All of those combined, it's estimated about $4 billion a farmer loses each and every year, so that's a huge problem. 
on top of the dung fouling that I brought up. Once the pat's out there, uh, the cows, whether it be just it's not very attractive smelling or learn responsive of it tastes bad and disease transmission is possible, they'll avoid the grass around the dung pat. And uh, studies have shown up to five to six times the area of that dung pat itself around it will be avoided by the cattle. So you're losing a ton of potential forage and that's gonna lead to a lower grazing efficiency and potential economic losses for the farmer. Not uh, a good thing if you get their opinion. So what, uh, so my thesis revolved around three big questions. What's the role dung arthropods play to degradation? What makes up this dung community and how does, how, I'm, how a rancher is managing cattle going to affect them with a big emphasis on pest population? And as I said, today we're just gonna look at that first big question there. And this was achieved through a dung sentinel pat experiment. I was really popular around the lab while this was going on, as you can probably guess. And what it involved is getting up early in the morning and following around cows, collecting fresh dung. These cows were on a pasture where uh, no insecticide treatment has been used in the last 10 years on the cattle. So this is clean dung, or at least as clean as it can get. And uh, that dung was collected, taken back to the lab, and frozen to eliminate all arthropods that could be colonized in it already. Once that dung was thawed out, it was weighed into individual, uh, approximately one kilogram bags, and those bags acted as a sentinel pack uh, that would be placed out and have degradation and arthropod metrics measured. This was done twice in the year, an early and a late season in the summer of 2016 to uh, see if there's any kind of seasonal effect throughout the grazing period. During each of the repetitions, 84 of those sentinel pats were used, and once they were all placed out, uh, a random assortment of pats were taken at 2, 4, 7, 14, 28, and 42 days to measure throughout those different times how arthropods and the degradation has changed. And those pats were divided into three treatments laid out here. Uh, far left, you see the really nice fresh pat. That's uh, representing the total arthropod inclusion. There's nothing stopping uh, any sort of insect from jumping in that pad and going to town. On the far right, that's the exclusion cage. The same kind of size dung pads put out. It's got a PVC pipe cylinder hammered in about six inches down, so it's really difficult for anything to go underneath it and get to the pad. And then on top, a window screen is zip tied on there to prevent any flying arthropods from jumping on. Now in the middle, that's our open cage treatment, and it's got the same PVC pipe, but you can kind of see on the side there, there's windows flush to the ground, so anything crawling on the soil surface can still get into the pad, and instead of a mesh screen, it's just got the chicken wire there that anything can uh, get through. And so that's gonna help us really isolate the effect that arthropods have and really prove that, that to see if the cylinder itself is inhibiting degradation at all or if it's just the arthropods. And right away, we're seeing huge differences. Uh, I've got them in the same place, our inclusion where arthropods can get into. You already see it's kind of got that Swiss cheese thing going on where there's already tons of activity of things going in and out. It's covered by the mesh, but you, or the screen, but you can see the same kind of thing going on here, whereas uh, once that PVC pipe cylinder with the mesh screen is taken off, you see that dump pad, it's got kind of a crust forming on it, but otherwise it looks just about the same as it did before. And tons of these measurements were taken, as I said, the last day was 42 days, and here there's a really stark contrast you can see in that inclusion. I mean, there's only a fraction that left, there's whole chunks of it that have degraded from uh, arthropod activity, and the other one, it's got that white baked look that I'm talked about. The open cage, uh, I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot more because as we had hoped there was no significant difference between the open cage and the inclusion so that showed that all these differences among degradation was done solely by the arthropods. And what kind of arthropods did we find? Well, uh, huge, huge community. 109 different morpho species. Each one of those represents a unique specimen found and that totaled just shy of 87,000 insects. I can promise you that was a whole lot of fun to go through. Um, the, the graph on the right is divided uh, early season on the top, late season on the bottom. And on the x-axis, all the days that we randomly selected paths, y-axis is total arthropod abundance. And 
those peaks you can see, that indicates that there was, in every pad, an average at that day of about 1,400 specimens. So these are real hot spots of activity. There's just tons of stuff going to it because it's such a uh, really high stark nutrient island among the grass. Um, in the early season, you saw that peak happen about seven days post deposition. It was a bit earlier in uh, the late season. We're attributing that to it's later in the season, hotter, the things are moving faster, and so the dung paths would be drying out just due to the sun. And so it's only attractive for a shorter period of time to all sorts of dung beetles and other arthropods. So they're going to a pad much quicker and doing their work at a faster rate. To supplement this, we also took uh, biomass. That graph shows the same thing early and late season with the dung pad ages, but it's arthropod biomass. And that's just showing us that right away we have huge peaks and right down that seven or 14 day mark, once a lot of that moisture is gone, it just stops being an attractive hotspot to arthropods. But we saw there's a ton of different stuff in there. What are they doing? Well, uh, in both um, the part of whoops, dry weight and the percent of the weight contributed by organic matter, the dung arthropod community had a significant effect of lowering uh, those amounts in the pack. Now, normally when we think of organic matter, we want more of it, but this loss of organic matter in the dung pad just means that arthropods have taken that dung, that uh, the organic matter portion of the dung and either consumed it themselves or buried it and made it remove the pad, put it underground to a point where it's accessible to the surrounding forages plant roots, those nutrients can be taken up. And so we saw it was significantly uh, more degraded, but at what point do these dung pads totally disappear? Using linear regression with the uh, weights, we can uh, take it out all the way to completion. Uh, and we found out that in the inclusion cages, when total arthropods were allowed to get in there freely, you're gonna be about 68 days it'll take for all the organic matter to be removed. And when the exclusion, so a limited amount of arthropods getting in there, is 104 days. So you're gonna have that dung pad out there about 40 to 30 to 40 days more if you don't have a good arthropod community. And when you've only got five, six months to graze in areas like South Dakota, that extra month of available forage can really mean a lot. One last thing we were really thinking about is, is there a certain species that's driving this? And it didn't take us long to figure out that dung beetles were that culprit. Out of the total arthropod abundance taken, dung beetles were only about one and a half to three percent, so only a fraction of them, but all uh, dung arthropod metrics strongly influence the arthropod community as a whole. And what that means is shown on the graph here. Um, this is a measure of dung beetle diversity and Shannon H diversity. And um, the y-axis total arthropod abundance. And as you have a greater diversity of dung beetles in both the early and late season, you ended up having a greater total arthropod community. And what's driving this is, as you can see, I got two nice big guys right here. Dung beetles are some of the larger members of this dung arthropod community that, as their name would suggest, they're really good at moving through the dung. And they create what we call in a highway system. They, they're the ones contributing to a lot of those holes that you saw on the dung pad surface, and those holes open up the interior of the pad to all sorts of smaller and less robust species that wouldn't be able to be digging in the same way. And all those smaller, uh, you can call them microarthropods, contributing to a faster rate of degradation are driven by the ability of dung beetles to make those pads accessible. So in kind of conclusion for us, we found that there's a really diverse dung arthropod community colonizing the pad in waves that change throughout the season and as the dung becomes more or less attractive to them. That community is contributing uh, 33 to 39 days faster degradation, a really good thing to show farmers and say, hey, these guys are worth conserving and Dung beetles are a really good facilitator to this in driving that colonization by the rest of the community. As I said, this is only uh, the first chapter of my thesis defense, and I have a bunch more really great information on samples taken from ranches all over eastern South Dakota and how management practices uh, implement that or uh, impact that community, especially pests, and that will be discussed uh, my thesis defense uh, next Thursday upstairs in room 202. And if you're interested in more regenerative agriculture stuff like this or other projects, I really recommend checking out Blue Dash or Dot Farm for really cool information and research being done.
At this point, I'd love to thank all my committee members, the great undergraduates who are out there spending their summers digging through dunk pads with me, and the participating ranchers who so often have really fun attitudes about this, and I find I'm learning just as much from them as they do from me, maybe a little bit more even. Uh, and my, well, my funding sources at Dysis Foundation and the North Central uh, SARE. And at this point, uh, both of us would be happy to take any questions you guys have. Hi, so are you doing any companion work? You made it, um, you said that the pats, the dung you were using was chemical free. Mm -hmm. And my understanding, does that mean that the uh, pastures, the cows weren't getting the antibiotics or whatever, the medicine that impacts the dung community? And I'm wondering if you've looked at that other side of it to um, compare your results. Yep, so the question was if uh, the fact that there was no insecticides used, do I look at the other side? Yes, so for this, I wanted a, a clean slate with, with really good dung on a really good ranch, what it looked like. So this was a ranch that for the last 10 years they've been doing antibiotic, pesticide-free, grass-fed beef. That's why I chose that ranch as a site because I knew it would be sterile, environment free of insecticide. And the, the further chapters that I talk about, that I talked about there, one of the management practices is the use of insecticides as a treatment and a lot of that does end up in the dung paths. And so I looked at ranches all over eastern South Dakota and measured if if your rancher is using them, is that infecting affecting the dung arthropod community? And so just due to time, I don't have the ability to go through all of it, but I've got a ton of really great information showing how um, frequency of those ap kind of applications to cattle is going to negatively impact your community. It is. Okay. Any concerns about the freezing process doing any harm to the natural microbial community or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, that was a, a thought I had because um, you know, you're you're killing everything that's already in there because the cow's gut's full of microbes. And uh, I just based that upon methods in other literature. People have done similar studies looking at degradation metrics, and they they justified it. it's better to get a clean slate because <laughs> when you're out there following the cows with fresh dung, there's already flies laying eggs, there's already dung beetles taken off, and it just and uh, for the sake of getting those in arthropods in my exclusion cages, that would just kind of ruin the effect. So it was it was something I definitely did have to consider and weigh the cost of. And I'm sure there there uh, you might be some side effects of slower breakdown, but we still saw uh, that when total arthropod colonization happened, that 68 day typical <coughs> degradation, that's about in line where other studies have seen. So it wasn't too alarming for us. Yeah. So I'm curious, what was the like how diverse was the dung beetle community you found? And furthermore, what were your um, sampling methods for capturing those dung beetles? Uh, so he asked about uh, dung beetle diversity and the sampling methods. Do you mean in this study or when I was going out all over the place? Uh, I mean, I guess in, in just this study in particular. Yeah, so um, in this study, uh, all out of the 24 species, I think 22 of them were aphodius. So that was that dominated them. Uh, and so for this experiment, the pad was taken back, and immediately after I took it off, I put it in a plastic bag to make sure we weren't having things running around. And it immediately went into a Berlazi funnel system. And so what that is, it's a uh, it's a tube with a wire screen on the bottom. The dung pad's placed in it, and it's fitted flush to a uh, the ceiling of this rack with a light source, and all the arthropods uh, are trying to get away from that light source. They fall through the screen, and there's a collection vial underneath it. And so that was the measurement that I used. And that same way was used in my uh, sampling all over the state. I took a uh, soil core, which ended up being a dung core, it was just on top of the dung pack, immediately bagged that core, and took it back and used for lazy funnel extraction. I supplemented it with some uh, pitfall trapping. But it just didn't have, seem to have the, uh, uh, because so many of them are those dwellers, they didn't seem to have the uh, attraction to the pitfall traps, at least from the luck I had. I always had better luck with those cores and just getting them out of the Berlazi funnel system. Yeah. Um, probably more of a comment than a question, but you might 
uh, your relationships between organic matter and time, so essentially your decomposition functions. Mm -hmm. You might consider modeling that as a negative exponential as opposed to a linear yeah. decay, mm -hmm. um, simply because you're going to lose your most um, labile organic matter first. And what remains 60 days later is going to be the most recalcitrant or more difficult to, to, to decompose. Yeah, I think I looked because it was you saw it was the just a linear. And I when I was looking at that, I was trying to find the best one. And I think that only um, you know, like half of them, it, I judged it off the R squared value. I think it only improved at like 0 0.02 or okay. or gave or actually went lower 0 0.02 or so. I, I thought the same thing. Basically, the graph, right. it looks like an exponential decay thing to me, but the linear was. But biologically, yeah, bio negative okay. exponential probably mm -hmm. makes more sense than a linear. Okay. And Jacob, following up what Josh was saying, is because you stopped at 42 days, yeah. if you would run that selection, you know, out for a year, yep. you know, it would do that, that exponential decay. So it's only because of your constraints on your data that's why it looks linear yep. yeah what he's saying is that it's gonna do this because you're still gonna have organic matter six months you know one year and so you're not the come to get the eventually zero it's not gonna happen in 60 days because we know that it's not so I think that's it's just a constraint of your of yeah. your time frame that's why it's fitting your linear regression the best but in all reality it should be an exponential decay Yeah, Jacob, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, have you guys given any thought to or done any measurement on, this kind of goes back to the last two comments that really draw analogies to leaf litter decomposition. And there's a lot of literature out there on that. And how arthropods, aquatic and terrestrial, react to the litter. And the old peanut butter on the cracker analogy, uh, the microbes are important. And so I'm thinking about these different ranches that you look at across the state and how they might supplement or supplementarily feed their cattle in addition to what they're feeding on out in the pasture, including antibiotics, and how that might influence the microbial flora that's in the pack, mm -hmm. and how that might subsequently influence the nutritional quality of the pack. And decomposition. So, are, are you thinking about doing any kind of, you know, investigation of what microbes are in the path, what the microbial activity is, what are the insects really after? Is it nitrogen rather than organic matter, as it is on most leaf litter, and where the microbes become actually the more important part rather than the organic matter itself, and they're just eating the cracker because the peanut butter's on it. So, have you? Give any thought to that? Yeah, yeah, I've given a ton of thoughts as I was constructing this whole thing. Um, um, the the degradation that was uh, mostly observed in this study, the sampling all over, that was really just a measurement of the, just the arthropod community, and that's just due to the constraint. That was uh, <laughs> it's just uh, just sampling the arthropod community was just a ton of fun, but. Um, there's definitely, I definitely assume that there's some sort of attractive difference based upon, because the, the nutrient quantity, how, what kind of grass they're consuming, that's definitely affecting the attractiveness of the dung pad, and that's huge, especially to dung beetles. So I know there's definitely going to be some differences, and I've tried to, um, interviewing, cataloging the management practices, I've tried to get as much information as I can, but um, I haven't looked specifically at dietary supplement stuff. It's mostly been uh, in the, as far as the later chapters going, the uh, management practices of rotation frequency, how often you're moving them paddock to paddock, uh, grazing intensity, and then the application of insecticides, specifically abermectins. And so that's just, those would all be things I'd love to look at, but I think that just getting too too outside of the scope of what realistically could get achieved with a study on this scale. Well, the reason I bring it up is because several years ago I had a master's student who was interested in bacterial source tracking for E. coli in water. <clears throat> and a lot of it comes from cattle. Mm, yeah. and, and he sampled fecal material from cattle across the state and looked at antibiotic resistance profiles and they vary across the state. Oh, cool. So, so there's different 
antibiotics that are being treated to these animals that are influencing their microbial gut mm -hmm. flora, and that's and, and influencing their antibiotic resistance. So that might suggest that there might be different bacterial communities in paddocks that are treated where the cattle are fed differently. Oh, for sure. And that might subsequently have an impact on your Dumb attractiveness. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely, and and this has been a really fun system to work with. And uh, between my advisor and my wife, you know, I got to cut it off at three years sometime. So yep. I would love to keep looking at this stuff, but uh, no, I'm thinking yeah. bigger picture. Yeah. For that whole Does anybody uh, uh, attending remotely have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, I guess this is more of a, a comment than question well first for you so for this project you put the fresh dung pads out just in june right like june 10th or whatever yep that was the early one and then oh gosh uh july 28th i want to say was the late season one okay yeah because i mean it just kind of draws into kind of the prior comments of you know different um Variation in the community and how that might affect um, your degradation time. But I mean, it's been found that the, the dung beetle um, community will change throughout the season. Yep. So I mean, you're probably going to get more of those the Fodenai and dwellers early on, and then later season you might see more of those rollers or tunnelers, and those larger dung beetles might break up that dung a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, that's good that you had one like later July, um, but did you, you see any difference between those two time points? Yeah, yeah, The so the early season uh, had fewer, or had more overall dung beetles, as, as you said, those uh, Fodii, they're more abundant early in the season. Um, and yeah, I think it was the uh, Unthophagus, that was kind of what replaced them more so in the later season, and those are a bit bigger. And so you had this pretty similar levels of degradation, even though there was a lower overall abundance. And I think what you're saying is reflected there that there's, and it's and it's certainly um, uh, in that 16 ranch study I had, I sampled monthly. And so there's definitely it's definitely really cool seeing you know one that's seen in all 15 of the 16 ranches in May you saw this one species, and then by August it's not in any of them, and then some have the exact opposite. There are really cool, um, subtle things, and, and uh, I try to include as much as I can, but uh, yeah, and I, I think this is definitely something years from now, I'll love to go back and look at little things like that and tease out some cool trends in the data. All right, thanks everyone, let's give a big one.